Welcome to worship on this Mother's Day Sunday with Christ, Indianapolis United Methodist Church. I'm grateful for our worship leaders today in honor of Mother's Day, Olivia Bullock and John Rose II. We have beautiful flowers today, and we are grateful for Libby Bales as she remembers Margaret and John Cabell at their birthdays, and her husband, John Bales, for his birthday, April 14th. Donna Feaster's birthday is being remembered uh, April 13th with beautiful flowers, and Sherry Storms is remembering her mother with yet another beautiful bouquet. And uh, we have a red rose. The red rose is in honor of the birth of Trudy Koopman's great-granddaughter, Adeline May Krintz, born May 2nd, 2020. This reading is dedicated to my mother, Diana Bullock, and my grandmother, Carolyn Bullock. A reading from Psalm 31. In you, O Lord, I seek refuge. Do not let me ever be put to shame, and your righteousness deliver me. Incline your ear to me, rescue me speedily. Be a rock of refuge for me, a strong fortress to save me. You are indeed my rock and my fortress. For your name's sake, lead me and guide me. Take me out of the net that is hidden for me, for you are my refuge. Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. My times are in your hand. Deliver me from the hand of my em enemies and persecutors. Let your face shine upon your servant. Save me in your steadfast love. The Lord is with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, to, true you know, to truly know you is everlasting life. We thank you on this Mother's Day for all who have set an example of godliness for us. Mothers, grandmothers, and other godly women, grant that we may know your Son, Jesus Christ, to be the way the truth, and the life, that we may always and in every way follow his steps in the way that leads to eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. And we all say, Amen. <laughs> reading from the book of John, chapter 14, verses 1 through 14. This reading is dedicated to my mother, Sherry Rose, who I love very much. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? 
And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. But if you do not, then believe me because of the works themselves. Very truly I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact will do greater works than these, because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If in my name you ask me anything, I will do it. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our Eastertide sermon series, What's Behind the Curtain, leads us this week to the way, the truth, the life. One of the realities of the United States of America is that there's always been plenty of room. If there hadn't been plenty of room, there wouldn't have been Albert Einstein. He was uh, in Nazi Germany with a $5,000 bounty on his head when he emigrated to the United States in 1933 and then became a citizen in 1940. If there hadn't been plenty of room, there would have been no God bless America. Irving Berlin emigrated with his family from the Russian Empire when he was just five years old. His earliest memory is lying on a blanket in a ditch as uh, Russian forces burned his Jewish family's home. If there hadn't been plenty of room in the United States of America, there would have been no affordable color TVs or FM radio because it was Sarkis Tarzian, an Armenian Christian emigre from the Ottoman Empire and the Armenian Genocide, who came to Bloomington, Indiana and founded that business that first manufactured affordable color TV tuners and affordable FN radio, and we got WTTV Channel 4 out of it too. If there had not been plenty of room in America, there would have been no Google because Sergey Brin emigrated with his family from Soviet Russia in the 1970s. And uh, if there hadn't been plenty of room in the United States of America, there would be no Kim, Courtney, or Khloe Kardashian because their family also were Armenian Christian emigres. On the base of the Statue of Liberty, there is a poem that was written by Emma Lazarus. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest-tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. Emma Lazarus wrote that poem uh, as a fundraiser for the base, the pedestal of the Statue of Liberty, before it was being built. And Emma Lazarus donated her poetry, and then it was forgotten. It was forgotten until Joseph Pulitzer and the New York Times uh, started a campaign to have it put on the base of the statue. Emma Lazarus is important because she is descended from one of the 23 Sephardic Jewish families that were among the first Jewish immigrants to the United States and not when we were even British colonies. Her family came to New Amsterdam, which then became New York. Plenty of room? Well, only if you know the way. Now, we remember from the Wizard of Oz that Dorothy was a bit perplexed when she was told by the Good Witch she needed to go to the great Wizard of Oz in the Emerald City. And she said, I don't know the way. And they all started singing, follow the yellow brick road. The only problem was when Dorothy got to the great wizard and the Emerald City, the wizard himself really didn't know the way. And 
at the end of the movie, remember when she's going to get in the balloon and fly back home to Kansas with the wizard and suddenly he takes off without her? Remember what he says, child, you're talking to a man that's laughed in the face of death, sneered at doom, and chuckled at catastrophe. I'm petrified. <laughs> he wasn't the way, and he didn't know the truth. Well, Jesus says there's plenty of room for all of us in today's gospel lesson, John 14, in the first three verses. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if it were not so, what I've told you, that in my Father's house there's plenty of room for everybody. Is that something that was original with Jesus? No. We find in the Old Testament in Deuteronomy 10 and Leviticus 19 and Zechariah 7 that we as followers of the living God are obligated to welcome the stranger, the foreigner, and the widow, and the orphan to take care of the ones that the world tends to forget and neglect. Jesus emphasized that again in Matthew 25 when he was telling the story of the sheep and the goats and he said, when you welcomed the stranger, you did it to me. And in Acts 10, Peter preaches, saying, It's true to me now that God shows no partiality. Every nation and anyone who honors God is welcome. And then Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5, We know that if this earthly tent we live in is destroyed, God has prepared a place for us in heaven eternal. And all of our groaning and longing here is just because we want to get there. Well, how do we get there? Jesus says again in John 14, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes unto the Father but by me, the way. In John 10, Jesus told us, as we remember last week, I'm the gate, the way, into safety, into shelter. In Acts 4, Peter again is preaching and says, There is salvation in no one else. There is no other name under, under heaven given to us by which we may be saved. And in Acts 18, there's the story of Apollos, a native of Alexandria, who had been teaching the way. And then the apostles begin to more thoroughly show him how Jesus is the way. Jesus is the truth. It says in John's Gospel, first chapter, the law was given through Moses, grace and truth have come through Jesus Christ. In John 18, Pilate is questioning Jesus, and he says, so you're a king? And Jesus says, well, you say I am, and yes, I really am, and for this I came into the world, and my witness is to the truth. Remember what Pilate's response was? What's truth? In Ephesians 4, Paul writes, Surely you have heard about Jesus and were taught in him, for Jesus is the truth. And the life? Again, John 1, In him was life, and that life was the light of men. John 5, For the Father has life in himself, and the Father has given life in Jesus. John 11, Jesus says, I'm the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will never die. And 1 John 1 that which was from the beginning, which we've heard, which we've seen with our own eyes, we have gazed upon it. This is the life that was revealed in Jesus Christ. And then we come to a really tricky issue. Jesus says, whatever you ask in my name, I will give you. Does that mean we can ask for anything and Jesus will give it to us? Uh, bad fortune for our enemies, uh, pleasures for ourselves, luxury. Is that what we're supposed to ask for in Jesus' name? Well, in Matthew 7, Jesus does affirm that. He says, ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened. But in Matthew 18, Jesus says, if any two of you agree and ask for it in my name then it will be given. In John 15, Jesus says, if you remain in me and ask in my name, it will be given. And in 1 John 5, the evangelist says, if we ask anything according to his will. So what does that mean? We have to stay with the way, the way that is Jesus, the truth, the truth that we find only in Jesus and life, life beyond this life. It is the very embodiment of our risen Savior. Well, 
The Bible has some pretty interesting stories about immigrant women mothers. Uh, one of the most impressive is the story of Rahab the harlot. Do you remember her? She was the prostitute in Jericho that the Israelite spies stayed with. And then she hid them from the folks in Jericho who were determined to kill the Israelite spies. And for that, she and her whole family were saved after the battle of Jericho when the walls came tumbling down. And Rahab the harlot became prominent in the genealogy of Jesus. We hear that recounted in Matthew chapter 1. And Rahab the harlot was a mother of Boaz, who was the father of Obed by Ruth. Ruth was another immigrant mother, a Moabitess, who became the mother of Obed, the father of Jesse, the father of King David. So immigrant mothers figure prominently in Holy Scripture. Immigrant mothers figure prominently in our own current history. Mary McLeod Trump was the youngest of 10 children on a Scottish island that was utter and total poverty. She emigrated to the United States, served as a servant and a nanny in New York City houses until she happened to meet Fred Trump. Mary McLeod Trump's first language was Scots Gaelic. English was always her second language. How did she raise her five children? She raised her five children in church and Sunday school. Our president was sworn in on the Bible that he received in Sunday school, Presbyterian Sunday school. What kind of witness did Mary McLeod Trump live before her children? Well, she was a noted volunteer at uh, the Jamaica Hospital Center. In fact, a whole wing is named for her, the elder care wing of that hospital. She and her husband were active volunteers in Boy Scouts of America, active volunteers with the Salvation Army, and active volunteers in a special mission for uh, sight-deprived persons. She had a special concern for children born with cerebral palsy, and she worked hard for adults who were mentally impaired. Mary McLeod Trump was a very good witness to her faith, and she did her best as a wife and mother. Well, Madeleine Albright is another awesome uh, immigrant wife and mother. She and her family came to the United States of America after World War II from Czechoslovakia. What she didn't know is that her parents had been Jews in Czechoslovakia who converted to the Roman Catholic faith. And her father is a diplomat for Czechoslovak Yugoslavia, really, after World War II. Uh, finally decided that communism was something he could not stand, so they emigrated, came to Colorado. And uh, Madeleine Albright uh, was an outstanding scholar and uh, she became a wife and mother and then uh, Secretary of State for the United States of America, first woman. What's equally interesting is that her father was professor at the University of Denver for the second woman, Secretary of State, Condoleezza Rice. Well, there was a program called New Americans that was aired on PBS in 2004. And they invited immigrant children to bear witness to their experience. Listen to what some of them said. Andrew from Cincinnati, Ohio says, My mom's father was born in Sicily. His father died when my grandfather was an infant, and being a single mother with four children, she had no other viable options but to immigrate to the United States. She and her family were sponsored by a United States citizen, a Spanish landowner, Spanish-American, in Colorado, and that's how he became a U.S. citizen. Jen says, my mother's parents were from Italy. They came at the turn of the century. My dad's grandparents were from Ireland, and these Italian and Irish Catholics earned the American dream. She says, I'm an attorney and I am the first college graduate and law school graduate because of the sacrifices that my mother and my father were willing to make for me. Adrian in Chicago says, I was born in Chicago, but my family came from Argentina. My father came first and then a whole year later, my mother and my sister came up here after living in a refugee camp. 
My father told stories about his first job in Chicago working in a men's suit factory being paid 10 cents for every jacket he ironed. They came for the better life, but I'm most proud of my mother, who is now a principal in an elementary school. Jack Garbutt says my mother lost her entire family in the Holocaust. Everything that they'd ever had was taken from her. She met my father in a Red Army prisoner of war camp. They were going to go to Palestine, but instead they came to here in 1949. We lived in a tenement and then a housing project and then an apartment. And then finally, we realized the American dream in 1960, buying our first home. Most immigrant families struggle for years to get a footing. And that whole time they're striving for their children to be educated, and I'm so grateful to my mother and my father for their sacrifices. Aminata Johnson says that she was born in Liberia, and during the Liberian Civil War, her mother determined to bring her daughters to the United States so that they could have the hope of a better life. Aminata's mother wanted to study nursing. She never got it done. She always worked two jobs, first as a housemaid, a housekeeper, and now as a, a caretaker for elderly in a nursing home. Aminata realized her mother's dreams. She graduated from uh, a Colorado State with a degree in computer science. Her sister is in nursing school. She says, I owe everything to my immigrant mother. Aya Badir, founder and CEO of Little Bits, which is described as the computer age version of Legos. They market $99 computer kits to teach children how to be computer literate, computer savvy, and even build their own computers. Aya Badir says that uh, the thing she misses most being a Lebanese Syrian immigrant through Canada to the United States is hearing her Arabic language. She says there's a word in Arabic, it's called Kazdura, and Kazdura literally means let's go for a walk or a drive, but she says what it really means is let's get to know each other a whole lot better. She says, I miss that sentiment of wanting to get to know each other a whole lot better. On this Sunday where we honor mothers, Jesus invites us to get to know each other a whole lot better, to go for a walk with him along the way. And as we walk along the way with Jesus, he becomes the way. And as we learn and listen from the truth of Jesus, he becomes our truth. And when he becomes our truth, then he can be our life. Life here, full and beautiful, life eternal with Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, on this Mother's Day, we're so grateful for our mothers, our grandmothers, our forebears, the women who braved the frontier, braved immigration, braved poverty, braved rejection, even in hostility, but forged the way for us to be where we are here now and to know all the good things we know. We are so grateful for our mothers and their sacrifices. And we're so grateful for our mothers who brought us to Jesus, took us to Sunday school, sent us to church camp, gave us our first Bibles, who read Bible stories to us before bedtime, taught us how to pray. Jesus, we're most grateful for you, for you are the way and the truth and the life. And we thank you for this way that we can walk with you every single day and for this truth that helps us understand what really is true and for the hope of this life that is beyond this life and gives us courage and strength to live through these difficult days. It's in Jesus' name we pray and ask this. And we all say, Amen.